So just for the video, uh, welcome everybody. We're gonna have a live skill workshop today. Yo and I will be doing this training. So to start with, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Malvika. I'm based in London and I work as the community manager for the Turing Way. I'll give it to you. Awesome, thank you Malvika. Uh, so hey everyone, my name is Yo Yehudi. Uh, I am currently in between jobs now. Uh, last week I worked at the University of Cambridge and next week I work at the Wellcome Trust in London. Uh, and I will start by uh, talking a little bit about what ally skills are and what allies are. So I'm going to share my screen. There's always the fun bit of, uh, can you see it? Um, okay, that looks promising, share. Okay, uh, you can see my screen. I've got thumbs yes. up, fantastic. And I'll put it into share mode. No, not share. Always press the wrong button. <laughs> and present will work better. Okay. Right. Okay, so today we are doing a hands-on discussion about ally skills. And a lot of this material was taken from the Frame, Frameshift Consulting Ally Skills Workshop. Um, you can actually see there's a link to uh, the materials. They are CC by share alike, which means that you can reuse them and modify them as you wish, but we need to say who they were from and that we need to share them with others. Um, so also in the etherpad, there are links to these slides if you wish to um, view the slides yourself. And there is also a handout that you can look at for later on. Oops. Okay, so um, to very briefly define ally skills, I might say this is using our societal advantages for good, um, but we'll try and go into some more definitions of what exactly ally skills are, what ally means, um, and even what things like advantages uh, and privilege means as well. So, uh, first of all, to give you an idea of what the session is, um, so this is adapted from a four hour workshop. We don't have four hours, we have about an hour and a half, uh, so we want to make the best use of the time we have, and please do go over some of the other materials later on because there is more than we can discuss at the minute. Um, went too far. Right, so this isn't a certification, uh, nor is it an apology or any sort of trend or anything like this. Uh, neither does it represent our employers or legal advice. Uh, but what we are trying to do is make sure that we're aware of what our society is like and how to be a better ally. We're also not actually going to discuss in this workshop whether or not oppression exists. So we are assuming that it is and we are assuming that it's something that we should stop and this is not actually something that is going to be part, form part of the debate today. So we'll start with a bit of an introduction. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a set of scenarios. So we're going to say here is a scenario where you could perhaps be an ally or where there's an opportunity to be an ally uh, and talk about what you can do and ways that you can handle these different scenarios. And the first scenario that we'll do will be a, sort of as a group, as a warm up session. And then later on, we will break out into smaller breakout groups, maybe actually only one group. Uh, but we'll, anyway, we'll break out into groups for, to discuss some of these scenarios in a smaller, in a smaller group. Uh, and then finally, we will have a short wrap up and discussion about what we discuss in our groups later on. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to ask what is an ally? Uh, does anyone actually want to unmute or share in the chat or in the etherpad if you have any thoughts about what an ally means? And there's, there's no wrong answers here. maybe someone who isn't personally um, affected by oppression, uh, but still wants to do something about it. Yep, that's great, that's great. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, no, that's great, that's fantastic. Uh, so what we're going to do to discuss uh, what an ally is, we're actually also going to discuss some terminology around allyship. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to go for privilege. So this is an unearned, unearned advantage that's given to, uh, by society uh, to some people, but not to all people. And we will also talk a little bit about oppression. 
sorry, my tongue's very tired today. Uh, so a question is a, an inequality that is present throughout society and that tends to benefit people with more privileges over people who um, have fewer privileges and sometimes will even harm people with these fewer privileges. Um, and so then to define an ally, uh, you have to think about uh, using these two previous terms that we have where we talk about privileges and where we talk about oppression. Uh, an ally is someone who wants to take conscious actions to actually help out people who have fewer privileges. So this is a scenario where you are someone who isn't disadvantaged uh, by a given uh, privilege or lack of, and you want to, know, knowing your own privilege, actually step up for someone who doesn't have that privilege. Um, and it's also taking conscious action to try and um, to help someone out, um, someone who is from one of these oppressed groups or marginalized groups. Um, one thing I will actually add is that it's also really important to think about your own safety when doing this. So it could be there are scenarios even where you might not be part of the um, part of the marginalized group, but it still isn't necessarily safe uh, to take these actions. So you always need to, th to when, when you are taking conscious actions in this way, think about your own safety and about the environment that you're doing this in uh, before you do any stepping up. Uh, and so there's different types of privilege. We have some listed here. Uh, so for example, it could be, uh, let's say I work in academia um, and I could say one of the privileges that I have is that I work in science um, perhaps as opposed to being a support staff or an admin worker. Uh, or it could be um, education equally. So someone in science with a PhD might have, could be considered to have more privilege than someone else. Uh, it could be something like a lack of disability or a place of residence. So there's a lot of different types of privilege beyond the ones that might pop into your head straight away. Um, and so if we want to talk a little bit about some of the basics of ally skills, so if something comes up, so you have a scenario where you've, you've noted uh, that someone has said something inappropriate or acted in an inappropriate way, and it may be that they're aware of it, or it also could be that they're not actually aware even of what they're doing because biases can be unconscious or, and they might not even be uh, ill-intentioned. Um, but if you, if you note a scenario where you think that you are um, in a place to be an ally, um, so some of the basics is that be short, simple and firm uh, and don't try to be funny. So if someone makes, let's say, an inappropriate joke, making another joke back doesn't necessarily take you uh, advance the causes and it may not be perceived as serious. Try not to play for the audience. Um, and another thing is to practice really simple responses. So that's part of what the workshop today is about. That if you practice handling things, you may see some of the scenarios where actually, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said it this way. And you can refine your responses and make them more meaningful and useful. Uh, and I think I mentioned also a little bit earlier about um, picking your battles. Yeah, okay, Chris. Yeah, if anyone's having any problems, sorry, I should have said this earlier with connection or anything like that, please do uh, feel free to turn off your video. That's absolutely fine. Um, also, again, if you don't want to be recorded or if you just would rather not be observed, that's absolutely fine to leave your video off. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so I was talking about picking your battle. So this is, again, assessing your environment, looking at what's going on and making sure that you are somewhere where it's safe and appropriate to take this stance. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Malvika. Do you want me to advance the slides for you? Thanks. Or do you yes, want to? That, yeah. that okay. would be good. So why should allies take action more than targets? Uh, already Chris said, I'm um, sorry, Mika said that it is because they are not from the minority group because members of minority groups, for example, female leaders who will engage in diversity valuing behavior are penalized with worse performance ratings. Uh, whereas members of majority groups who engage in diversity valuing behaviors are not penalized in doing so. Um, if you wanna know a little bit more about it, you can uh, visit this link and the slides are linked in the etherpad. So coming back to that, why else do you think an ally can take more action? And for that, I'll say, take a couple of minutes to quietly write down in your etherpad what your personal will for taking an action would be. Okay, I'll, I'll read out some of these. Allies face less repercussion than target would for saying something. 
Targets already deal constantly with impact of operation. Allies have more scope to step back and react to a situation. That's that's actually really, really important because um, people who are constantly in a situation of operation have a lot to deal with and often they wouldn't have a response that they will believe the people will respect. So this is really great. In the situation, the target is emotionally attacked, which makes, poten makes it potentially more difficult to react, while as ally, it's uh, not personally attacked, which generally makes it easier to react. Allies, because of their privilege, already have an audience, can command to attention of power, of people with power, ability to change the course and experiences of marginalized communities and their voices are powerful. This is really great. Uh, can uh, whoever has written, do, you, do they want to explain a little bit? Um, yeah, I wrote that. Um, so I think that allies are people who um, identify with communities that have privilege um, and belong to these communities. And so they understand the semantics. Um, when they stand, they are likely uh, to pull an audience faster and command attention more than a marginalized person would. Um, and so the barrier to entry to beginning that conversation is um, very low or significantly lower for them. And they're likely to not be dismissed. Um, they will be heard first. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Does uh, so I'm not going to read rest of it, but I am going to open the floor for whoever want to verbalize what they wrote. If not, then thank you for the notes. It's really, really great, uh, especially when we want to come back and have a look at all these to, to reinforce why we want to take action as a lie. Let me share my screen. So just to reiterate what you all have said, allies have more power and influence. They, have, they are often majority. Uh, allies are not penalized for diversity valoring behaviors. They have more time and energy and they can't be accused of jealousy. Uh, they are seen as altruistic, given and kind. So what's the use of the terminology. Uh, Yo has already talked about different terminology and uh, why it's important for us all to understand these terminologies so that we can use the right words. It is very important. Um, we have linked a handout on the etherpad, which you can have a look at later. But just to iterate, here are a few things for which you should know the terminology. While you're trying to help one group, you shouldn't try to put other group down. For example, if you're trying to stand up for sexist behavior, you should not be homophobic, or you shouldn't make any uh, remark that puts other group who is already marginalized in one situation down. Um, so if, please take your time to understand what these uh, words mean. Uh, what does it mean to be racist, ableist, classist, ageist, body shaming? Um, and describing people is undesirable. The reason why we want to learn these difficult things is to understand why not to do it and when to stand up. So yeah, these were a lot of words in one, <laughs> one slide and quite, quite awkward. It can get really awkward. And when you're talking about this with people, there's always these kittens and little puppies to make us bring it back to this conversation that we are having. So what if we make mistake? We are always going to make mistake. We, we as an ally are also constantly learning. So the easiest way to go forward with that is to apologize. Correct yourself and move on. Don't hang on to it. Don't try to justify why you did what you did. It is really apologize, own your mistake and move on just to not make the other person feel like they need a explanation for your behavior. So I'll give this to you. Cool, thank you. I've got to catch up onto the right slide now with my, <laughs> my slide deck. Okay, I'm going to reshare and share screen and desktop number one, share. 
Okay, right. So hopefully you can see our test scenario. Uh, so what we're going to do now is just as a group, we're going to talk through a specific uh, scenario where you could act as an ally. Uh, and for this one, I'm going to suggest let's do a little bit more of the silent ether padding. Uh, so a, we have a scenario where it says a person in your field has been brought in to present their project and during the presentation their slides include several jokes which rely on sexual innuendo. When they take a question from the audience their reply includes jokes about the female reproductive system. Uh, now what would you as an ally do? So if you look on the etherpad line 63 and onwards there's some space to talk about what you might do in a scenario like this. Um, so just for, spend a minute or two, put that down, um, and then once we've spent a minute or two just writing down our thoughts, then we can discuss this a little bit as a group verbally as well. Right, I'll go through some of the things that we have here. Uh, so Chris says, it'd be nice if you keep out things that distract or constitute expensive jokes. So this is an, uh, directly addressing and saying, hey, this isn't cool, folks. I think we have a few more uh, like this. So for example, uh, further down, we have ideally already the, when the innuendo jokes happen, the speaker will be more considerate when choosing the type of jokes, uh, perhaps something along the lines of, I'd appreciate if the presenter would refrain from sexual references. Further down, we have, I would welcome if we keep the discussion professional. So there's a few people who just say, if there's room to address it head on and say, hey, that's not okay. Um, and we also have some really good questions, for example, uh, saying, depending on my role, is the audience so large that I need to get a microphone to speak up and can I get a microphone? Uh, so thinking about some of the challenges that you have, it may not be as easy as you hope to address some of the issues. Uh, and we have here, if the session, if, particularly if you're the session chair, but also possibly as an audience member, point out that the jokes added nothing to the conversation and distracted from the point being made. Uh, so some of these are really, really good here. Um, I like this one about the participating as part of the audience. So use my platform to speak up or point out the problem in an online space where event chatter is happening. For example, the event ether tag or a hashtag etherpad or a hashtag on Twitter. Or as an event organizer, um, you can sidebar the speaker. Um, and if necessary, that can even mean walking up to the stage and whispering in their ear to refrain. And after the state, after the session, issue a statement and use the event code of conduct to handle that issue. I think that's really important actually to note that as the event organizer, you are the one who has the power about what goes and what doesn't go um, and using that influence to express what is and isn't okay is really important. Um, and Eddie, uh, you've, you've noted apologizing to everyone at the event because you wouldn't know how to interrupt the speaker. And as an audience goer, that's, that's completely reasonable. Sometimes it's not that easy to interrupt or no, it doesn't feel safe to do so. Um, and I have another one here that a best immediate reaction to an inappropriate joke would maybe be awkward silence. And yeah, if you can pull that one off, it's great. Uh, sometimes that's hard because it's, it's hard sometimes to collectively action the same silence. <laughs> um, but if it does work, that's a really fantastic one. It's just like, that fell flat. That was not cool. And we don't even need to say anything. Um, and then we have a great question here. I'm going to open this one to the floor if anyone wants to share. So I really struggle with when to take action. Should I do this immediately in the moment or should I take the person aside afterwards? So does anyone want to address that or have any thoughts about that? So if I can uh, comment on that, um, and it's open for others to comment as well. If something is something like this is happening in the audience, people are getting affected immediately. So if you don't take an action immediately, you know that the harm has been done. So in situation like this, I would say the reaction should be immediate. And I understand it's very difficult to do that. And that's why we have these kind of training where you can simulate these kind of situation. There are a number of scenarios that you can discuss with people before that happens. So you're prepared the next time it happens. A lot of time it, it could be just simply as, can you explain me that joke? I don't get it. Like asking just satirically or just making sure that, oh, sorry, we don't do those kind of things here. The best way, as you a lot of you pointed out, is the code of conduct for sure that you can show, uh, but also share with the speaker before the event has started. So you can make them aware that these kind of things at no cost should happen. Um, to that, I know that there is a lot more to that question. So I'll ask others to also say what they want to share. Uh, 
Um, I can say something. Um, you know how events have the timekeeper seated at the front um, to signal, you know, you have five minutes left. Maybe events can also have a placard that says, you know, something to signal that maybe steer clear of that as you're speaking. So then someone doesn't have to walk up to the stage, but once that is flagged, then the speaker knows, okay, um, this is probably going in the wrong direction. I don't know what that would look like, but maybe that can be something that people can also do before. Um, in response to that question, um, I think that silence is inadvertently in such cases um, seen as complicity. Um, and, and as an ally, we should, um, you know, try our best to, to support the people who are being affected negatively. Um, so if, if they're seated next to you whispering that you don't think that's okay or signaling, um, then in whichever way that will be helpful. But <clears throat> I really like the idea of communicating it in a social space where people are having event shutter in some way. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, does anyone else want to comment or raise anything? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I say something? Mm, definitely. Yeah, you know, I've been wondering, you know, uh, what relationship the sexual Indos have to the project the person is presenting. Uh, I think the presenter is assessing somehow, you know, so trying to play down on, on the feminine group. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand. I'm saying that I've been wondering why uh, or what's the relationship between the sexual in Endos uh, and the project the presenter is presenting. Mm. So I see him, I see the presenter as a sexist somehow. You get my point? Yeah, yeah. I, so I think, I guess this is a scenario we're looking at where maybe uh, we didn't realize or maybe this, the speaker wasn't sufficiently screened, uh, but it can be really hard to pre predict this stuff and be aware. Sometimes it is as simple as not knowing that or, or not thinking carefully enough and not bringing a sexist presenter in. Um, but I think that despite that, it, these scenarios can still happen. If I might chime in, um, it still happens a lot because people think it's a safe way to make fun and kind of loosen up the atmosphere. Even if you go to a comedy show, chances are I don't know, five and 10 will do jokes that if you think about this, are not that funny. Um, so I think it's a really good way to set the um, expectations early and as an organizer share explicitly what's okay and what's discouraged. So I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important uh, point. For example, at, at the start of a meeting, uh, you may say we have a code of conduct, but use two or three bullet points about what may be going on in that code of conduct can, um, you know, what's within the code of conduct can be helpful for the rest of the group to actually understand what the expectations are and make sure that it's something that's actually acknowledged by the group rather than just a box checking exercise. Oh yeah, we've got a code of conduct is a bit less meaningful than treat one another with respect and here's some things to do that we'd like to encourage and here's things that you can't do. Um, um, I have a question to that. Sure. I mean, in I see that in like settings like conferences or so a lot nowadays that you already have code of conduct, but I haven't seen it at all in less formal things like uh, you invite a speaker to a group seminar, uh, stuff like this, where you don't have like an event per se. I mean, there is technically like somebody like a session chair that like invented them and will say yeah, like introduce a speaker or so, but there, where I was, there was not a code of conduct. I mean, is that only because I was in not very organized spaces or uh, or not very progressive? Or is it um, is it more difficult to have a code of conduct in these less formal spaces or do we still have to do that? Or how would you handle that there? 
So I would say it's reasonable to have it in any space. Uh, and if it's a space that you're organizing, then assert that you think that these are the values that we should adhere to. I don't think that it's necessarily harder when it's small. If anything, perhaps small organizations, it may be easier because there's fewer people to actually get on board. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's something we should, as allies, perhaps try and encourage that everyone should bring forwards and say, this is the culture we expect from here on. And I think also look at it the other way. Don't shame someone for not having a code of conduct. Just try to positively bring it in um, and say, this is something that, Hey, we've not had any problems and we're really proud of you. And we're bringing this in to make sure there aren't any problems in the future. I don't know if anyone else wants to add on to that. I wonder if there, this could come instead as a speaker's guide, which is a much more general practice in these kind of seminar than probably code of conduct. Uh, it shouldn't be the replacement, but I think that as a person who's in the audience, it, it's much easier for you to propose a speaker's guide than a code of conduct. Code of conduct takes a lot longer to process. Um, so I, I, I would say, Mika, that that could be the case. Sarah, you unmuted. Oh, oops. <laughs> um, but I, I can say something. Uh, I agree with Malvika, code of conduct um, take a long time. I have seen, um, I think, let me see, one second. Um, there's a conference code of conduct that was prepared by a few people on GitHub. It's somehow minimal and can be used um, in events and shared as is. So it's event agnostic that's that's the link to it and maybe as a person attending you can suggest this to people at an event um, so the link is confcodeofconduct.com you can suggest re resources like this to people who don't have a code of conduct that's a one pager that they can share um, with everyone who comes to the one hour meeting or, or so and that can be helpful Okay, I'm just trying to check if I'm on mute or not. Uh, come on, Zoom. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, the wrong thing was coming up. Right. I just want to say thank you, Sarah um, and Melvika, both for those points. Um, so I'm going to move on to the breakout groups because uh, I know Jez has to leave soon and I want to give them a chance to get into one of our first scenarios. Uh, so first of all, a little bit of discussion about the scenario that we had. Um, so reflecting on the scenario we've talked about, um, here are some things to think about, some points to think about rather. So if you're in a group, think about who is speaking in your group, who's speaking the most and whether anyone is having difficulty being heard. And that could be an important part of being an ally. For example, if someone's being spoken, speaking up and um, other people are speaking over them, or if um, other people are repeating their point and only then does it get heard. These are all things to think about, especially are there patterns related to um, any particular uh, privileges or oppression um, or particular groups like gender, race, age, etc. Um, and whether these discussions are different in other contexts that may be, there may be skewed biases that are happening in the group that you're in. Um, and if necessary, that may mean uh, reinforcing and making sure that you create the spaces for people who haven't been able to speak up uh, in a group. Like just um, one thing that I really like is a reminder. So for example, if you are in a group of N people, say try and speak no more than N percent of the time, or one nth of the time rather, um, and try and be mindful of how much you're speaking. Uh, make it known that it's not okay. So this is something that I think quite a few people said, if there is a problem and you are an ally and you feel like it's safe for you to speak out, then, hey, that's not cool. We don't do this here. Uh, can we keep this on topic? Um, or a Malvika's de demonstration, that's not funny. You know, it doesn't, you don't need this to be something that's long or elaborate, just make it cool. This isn't some, make it clear this isn't something that we tolerate. And then you can move on. Oh, no, I went the wrong direction. But okay, so now what we're going to do, I think we'll break up into probably two groups of three or four people each, roughly. Um, so we'll spend about 15 minutes and we'll choose a couple of different scenarios. 
So to find those scenarios, you can look at the slides in the Etherpad, or I think they're also in the handouts, are they, Malvika? Not sure. Okay. Well, I am, no, no, no. I am actually posting it on the Etherpad. So uh, if you can prepare the room, we can let them know which room they are in and what uh, scenario they are for. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and now I can see my Zoom properly and I'm no longer wondering if I'm muted anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to make breakout rooms. So what we'll do, um, a few uh, instructions before I send you off. Um, so we'll have about 15 minutes per the room. I've also, if you look at right at the top of the on line 83, there is a timer so that you have an idea of how long we'll be in the group. Um, so we'll start that timer when we head out to the groups and you'll see it ticking down. So, and it's a shared timer that will be the same for everyone. Um, but we ask for a few things. So one is to nominate two roles in your group. The first person is the gatekeeper. This is someone who chairs the session and just makes sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Uh, and the other is a spokesperson. This is someone to report back to the group afterwards. So try and nominate those. Uh, you can write those down in the etherpad if you wish. Um, and then spend a couple of minutes. You can in introduce yourself to one another and then um, and then discuss how you would handle at a given scenario. So we have, yeah, we have two rooms. And if you see there's breakout room one and breakout room two in the etherpad on lines 87 and 99. And you can see your breakout room number at the top of your Zoom room when we head to the breakouts. Uh, so is that all clear? Thumbs up if yes. I have, so I have thumbs up from the cameras. Okay, right. So I'm going to send you all off to the breakouts, breakout rooms and do two rooms, create breakout rooms. And that looks perfect. Okay, right, I will set the timer off in a moment and feel free to make notes while you're going. And see you soon. Hey, welcome back. That was really, really cool. <laughs> we had a great discussion. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to hear. I think we're just waiting for the other breakout room to come back. And the fact that they were delaying until the last moment is always promising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Di Jong, I'm so glad to see that you're here, that you could make it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'll be back in a moment. Okay. And welcome back, everyone. So we hope you had some interesting discussions. Um, I was just saying, it's always promising when you wait until the last moment before the timer expires to come back. It's like, you know, that's what you really wanted to finish off before you came back. <laughs> um, so we have two groups. Hopefully you'll manage to nominate a spokesperson from each group. So I'm going to mix things up and suggest that breakout room two starts. Okay, Jez, thank you so much for participating. Um, and see you later. Uh, yeah. Okay, so was there a spokesperson for uh, group two? So are we doing the conference scenario first? Oh. Oh, Mika had some issue hearing. Ah, so. Okay, right. Okay, so in that case, uh, let's delay a moment or two. Hopefully, uh, Mika will be back in a moment. Uh, can everyone else hear me okay, by the way? Mm -hmm. okay, yes. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Mika, any better? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so the right. breakout room one. Should I read the scenario? That sounds like a good idea. So the scenario is on a professional mailing list you belong to, a colleague who came out as a trans last semester starts a discussion. In the response thread, another person repeatedly misgenders them by using incorrect pronouns. What would you as an ally do? So the spokesperson is Eddie. Eddie, would you like to give us a snapshot of the discussion you had? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. So um, myself, Sarah, and um, 
Evgeny. We okay, so um first when we were talking, um Evgeny gave a very good point, which I think I would try to adopt in my own um view. Um so the first thing I think we should all do, like in such a situation as an ally, we should assume that this person who misgenders another person, we should we should assume that they do not know that, okay, um, this is the proper pronoun to use for this person. Um, so we should always appear positive first and tell the person to, oh, okay, this is how we should address, um, you shouldn't misgender, this is, how, this is how they should be properly addressed. And if the person is ap unapologetic, if I was a moderator, so we, are, we had an agreement, we're like, okay, so, there are two sides. As a moderator, maybe you could kick the person off the mailing list or you could escalate it to social media. Yes. Uh, reason for social media is um, in my country, where I'm from, Nigeria, and also where Sarah is from, Kenya, social media is like the more efficient path to justice. So taking the person to social media would be like, would really force an apology out of the person and would call the person out for such you know, behaviors. But first, we should always approach from a positive point of view and assume the person doesn't know the proper pronoun to use. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else from the group have anything you'd like to add? I noticed you unmuted, Sarah. I wanted to echo something Evgeny said. Um, he, um, Evgeny also mentioned that it will be important um, to insist on a communication of norms, um, community norms that should be shared in that mailing list. If you're in a position to, you can add this as, um, you know, something people agree to before they join the mailing list. Um, we, either way, it should be communicated in the mailing list time and time again. And that helps because when a situation arises and someone is corrected, that these are the correct pronouns to use and they, you know, disregard that, then they can be kept accountable and actions can be taken because this has been communicated and everyone is in agreement that, you know, these are our shared norms as members of this mailing list. It makes the conversations easier for when situations arise. Yeah. Thank you, that's um, really fantastic. And I think one thing that we keep on seeing emerging is people saying, set the norms, say what you expect to say, because it's one of the safest ways to assume that everyone's on the same page. <laughs> And that they're on the page you want it to be, more importantly, perhaps. Um, so does anyone from the other group have any thoughts or comments about, uh, about this as well? Feel free. Um, one thing I think which is maybe makes it easier than uh, some other scenarios you could think of there is because it's a mailing list. You do have time to think and maybe speak with others about it. So it's not like you have to react within 30 seconds or it's over and you will only ever regret not having done anything. It's that you can actually like probably, I mean, depending on the volume of the mailing list, you have an hour or a day or two to actually do something. So you can like speak with others about it. That is, I think, helpful there. Yeah, the asynchronous nature of the communication potentially does give you some extra speed, I would agree. Uh, that said, I, I have, remember one myself that I had to deal with a few months ago on a mailing list. Uh, and while I was deliberating the response, some more muck came in, which wasn't great. Uh, so it, people can be fast in the wrong scenario, which is frustrating. But you're right, there's not quite as bad as a chat room, for example. Um, unless it's a very empty chat room. <laughs> um, I actually had a question and I don't know if we have any good answers to this, um, but I've never lived in a country where things like homosexuality are illegal. And I was wondering if anyone who maybe had had any thoughts or advice on how safe it is to speak up, even as someone who's privileged. Uh, and you don't have to answer this if you're not comfortable also. 
Hi. Yeah. Um, so I live in Nigeria, and um, homosexuality. Um, I think it's fourteen years. Yes. If you're caught, if you're charged and tried in court, you're like you go to court, you go to prison for fourteen years for being homosexual. So um, people don't people do not really come out. Yes, you don't really come out. Um, we can't really, as an ally, at the workplace, I don't think anyone is comfortable coming out. Because if you come out, you're like saying, okay, I want to get charged with 14 years in prison. But the issue we primarily have here in Nigeria is the issue of referring to everyone as guys. So it's not directly like homosexual. I think I would make it like, for instance, um, uh, there's a Python group I belong to. Um, if someone wants to ask a question, the first thing they pop up with is, hi, guys. You know? um, yeah, so I, I think I've tried to correct them constantly with using, hi, everyone, hi, all. But I still get to face that. But, so over here, I think as an ally, I, get, I have more power controlling that. But when it comes to issues with homosexuality, being trans, being non-binary, uh, we can't really do anything down here. To be very honest, we can't really do anything because everyone is, you know, everyone is too scared. There are, there are a lot of people who have identified themselves to me as, oh, look, I'm a lesbian um, and I don't like, I don't do guys, I'm sorry. And I'm like, okay, that's good. But they can't really come out because when their parents, their parents are not going to accept them, the society will kick back at them. So no one actually comes out to the open. But a lot of people know who is, you know, the proper gender, the proper sexuality for everyone. A lot of people know that, but no one actually comes out in the open. Thanks, Eddie. Um, I guess that perhaps echoes a little bit back to choosing battles. And um, the battle that you mentioned that, you you know, it's easier to talk about, you know, not, try not to use hey guys and a mailing list and that's somewhere where it's safe for you to fight back as opposed to scenarios where potentially you could end up with legal ramifications. Um, does anyone else have anything to add on this scenario or shall we move back to the other group? Malika? Just, uh, just a thought that growing up, uh, of course, like in India, we aren't exposed to homosexuality until you're like, you know, at an age where you see people and you support your friends it's not illegal to be homosexual in India. However, I think there's still a lot of social um, construct that makes people feel embarrassed about their sexuality. And I think what really is powerful is friends helping friends and making safe space for them in private. And if that is empowering enough for them, they can actually hit, hold their head up and you know, own their own identity as who they are. So even, I suppose, Eddie, in countries where it is illegal, uh, this personal safe space for friends might be really, really powerful. All right, all right, thank you. Thanks, Malvika. Okay, um, this always ends up being really uh, vulnerable and personal. So thank you so much, everyone who's speaking up here. Um, breakout room two, uh, talking about the conf. Uh, no, we've already done the conference. Let's breakout room. No, we haven't done the conference. Sorry, I'm just getting completely confused. <laughs> so the other scenario, uh, a woman you don't know who is using a wheelchair is near your group at a conference. She is alone and looks like she would rather be talking to people. What would you as an ally do? Uh, so I don't, I think was it Micah and Chris who were in this group? I don't know if either of you feels comfortable reporting back. Yeah, I can also try to summarize. Um, we first thought that in principle, it's uh, pretty easy there, like from conceptually, because um, there is all, I mean, it's explicitly uh, a networking opportunity at the conference and there is already this rule. So you don't, you don't have to um, like 
yeah, you don't really have to expose yourself. If you like, if you are extrovert, you can just go there and say, hey, do you want to join us? Or if you're more introvert, you can remind your group about the Pac-Man rule to, um, to open the circle more. So that is, uh, that are things that are uh, like very normal and you don't have to, um, you don't have to do anything special. But we also talked about that you have to um, do that explicitly because it's easier to just don't do anything. And you have to um, make some space mentally and think about if there is a special problem because she's in a wheelchair, um, like is, is, is there are steps in the way your group is maybe standing like a couple of meters away and there are some steps where it's not easy to just go over with a wheelchair or maybe the height difference may be a problem for a um, for a discussion. So if there is a possibility to move to a table somehow or sit down, then that could be great. But I mean, you don't know if there is at the conference uh, easy uh, uh, wherever that is. So, but like more generally, you have to maybe like uh, think about the specific barriers that might be there. Now, and of course, in the whole thing, uh, that was something we uh, thought about last, <laughs> that you still have to be uh, non-judgmental. Maybe she just doesn't like to uh, talk to people at this moment. And yeah, this is the networking thing and everybody's expected to, but she still doesn't want to. And then you should just, yeah, I mean, offer it, but don't force it. Those are some great points. Um, especially glad that we had the realizing the height differential. Um, I mean, even as a short person, sometimes standing in a group is challenging. Never mind if I was actually always uh, further down. Um, and I like that there's the offer companionship, but don't force it. Um, because many of us, maybe if you've been at a conference for hours and hours, the thought of speaking a whole lot more can be so exhausting. Um, does anyone else have any comments or thoughts they'd like to add, either from the group or from the other breakout group? Um, could I add something? Um, I think it was at the in-person Carpentry Con 2018 that I first encountered this idea so that people generally should be welcoming. So if people at conferences kind of create their little subgroups, often it would be circles and it's difficult to join. But the idea was to always have a shape that has an kind of open area where someone else can um, join in easily. I forgot the name, but it had even had a name for this. Um, Man rule. <laughs> it's called Pac-Man rule because Pac-Man has always the mouth open. So it's oh, like right. a, is... a, a triangle of pizza is missing so anyone can come and join you. Thank you so much for that discussion. Uh, you should we just go through some of the responses that we have gathered? Sounds good. Uh, okay, um, I will share my screen again. And desktop one, share. Okay, you can see my screen where it says scenario mailing list. Yes. You can. Brilliant. Okay, so this was the first scenario where we talked about the professional mailing list where someone um, is repeatedly misgendering someone. Uh, so this is a great tip, Charles Rolls of Argument. Um, I learned about this a few months ago and within like 10 minutes I could see all the places that I could have applied this. I think I remember seeing Malvika going and applying it to a bunch of conversations as well because I think we um, discussed it at the same workshop. Um, but they're a really good set of rules. So first of all, don't go looking for an argument. Um, state your position once speaking to the audience. Uh, absurd replies will very often come as someone who may be offended or angry um, and you can reply one more time so just in case there were misunderstandings in case you said something that wasn't clear um, but at that point do not engage any further because it's not going to get any more productive so reply one time to the thing that happened whatever it may be say hey this isn't okay this is and speak to the audience not only the person who actually did the thingy but also 
to the audience so they understand why these rules are important and that part of your social um, expectations of this group, this is how we expect to behave. And then again, correct, correct misunderstandings. After that, enjoy yourself. There's no point feeding the trolls. Do not engage. It's not going to get any better. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a really, really useful set of rules um, for not just ending up in an endless spiral of arguments. Um, and some tips for discussions uh, or for groups like these. Uh, avoid things like rules lawyering. So for example, um, looking at really unlikely scenarios or split hair rules, they usually don't apply in the specific case and it's just a, an excuse for a continuing argument rather than anything that's necessarily going to be useful uh, for, for, for the people in question. So this goes back to, if you think about previously, there's um, things like be, be brief to the point, deal with it, and then move on. Um, so getting into the deep arguments doesn't tend to be terribly effective. Uh, we didn't do the new mother scenario, or we maybe can do it later on. Uh, so the second scenario that we discussed was the conference scenario. Um, we mentioned the Pac-Man rule that when there's a group of people, always leave room for one person to join your group. Um, and that's something you need to be active about also. So if someone joins that group, then that circle ends up closed. So make sure that you add another chair or that you expand the group size so that there is another empty slice of pizza, as Malvika put it. Um, and so you constantly need to... Um, uh, you constantly need to actually um, make sure that you're paying attention and you are making more space and continue to make it inviting even as the group grows or shrinks. Um, and so some tips for this scenario is invite other people to join, your to join your conversation. If you're standing, step away from the table and form a circle where everyone can see each other um, and move to an area where everyone can sit so that everyone's at eye level because uh, it's very disconcerting if you're actually staring at someone's stomach. Um, or, so, so try and put everyone at the same level where, wherever possible. Um, so what's the time at the minute? We have, it's 20 minutes past, so it's probably not time for another full breakout group. Um, what I, we could do is we could have a look through some of the other scenarios we have in the slides um, and ask any questions or if there's any comments. I don't know, Malvika, any thoughts? Should we just wrap up maybe? Would that be easier? I think we can open the floor for question. Um, things that they might have come as an expectation to this workshop and we haven't covered because we have shrunk the four hour workshop into one and a half hour. So we would still be happy to discuss some of the concerns you might have. Um, but as you said, these scenarios, we have, we have several of scenarios and these slides are available for you to have a look at and also the handout. But let's just take another 10 minutes that we have to just talk about things, uh, any difficult situation you may have had before that you would like to respond better to going forward in future. Okay, um, so I think we've uh, kind of slowed down our typing. So I'm just going to take a note of some of the responses here. Um, so I think, Sarah, you had a question about the allowing time for absurd reactions. Uh, so I just tried to clarify that this is more about correcting misunderstandings than it is about like leaving room for people to be mean. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, if, so there was an open source, uh, the, the open source OSI uh, group, they had actually a similar mailing uh, list scenario a few months right. ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the fact that their mailing list was moderated made a big difference. So mm. someone, when they started going off and misbehaving, they, their posts never made it public and they could actually step in and stop the nasty stuff from going public, yeah. uh, which is very helpful. And I have uh, someone says, uh, I think that's Mika, says be brief to the point, a simple message to the immediate situation, um, which I think if, if that was the single takeaway that we had, is just, just say no, that's not okay. Uh, the, the brief, the media is so important. It's one of the biggest takeaway messages. Um, but also having a code of conduct or explicit expectations is uh, one of the other really, really important takeaways from this. But you cannot expect a culture if you don't say what that culture needs to be. Uh, implicit rules are hard to find out. Explicit rules are not. Um, 
And one that I actually added as a personal one is just that it can be scary and emotional to stand up. And um, when I got taught my first aid skills, um, this is actually, you know, about blood coming out of someone or something like that. They always say, once you're done and you've, you've, you've cleaned everything up and the scenario is safe, go have a cup of tea and relax for a few minutes because this sort of stuff can leave you emotional. It can even send you into like adrenaline overdrive just from having like answered a mean email, for example. So um, it's okay to admit that and to deal with that and to look after yourself after you've looked after the other people as well. Um, I think we can wrap up. Does anyone have any final thoughts or comments? One thing which I wrote up uh, what I also was wondering there was um, um, as a question was um, this is all about more the immediate situation but of course you also kind of need a strategy f like stuff can happen again I mean you I, I, that is something that I'm also finding myself and I mean I, is, there is a community where someone very toxic I told them that's not okay they actually went away for half a year that was nice and then at some point they are back and i mean sure i can keep telling them, telling them that's not okay but if it doesn't change anything if i've done that for years then that is of course not a strategy which i mean it doesn't scale if it doesn't change i, I mean it's not it might be helpful in the immediate uh, situation but it's not uh, it's not enough to be uh, to actually change a culture i have the feeling no they can yeah, so in the code of conduct uh, training, uh, the person who's actually created this ally skill uh, workshop called Valerie Aurora, uh, she says that if your community needs protection, which means removing one person, it's important to remove them because the overall goal for your community is to make everybody feel safe. So if one person comes uh, over and over again, even you've given them warning, even they have been penalized, and if you understand that their behavior is toxic, it's okay to remove them. It's a really difficult decision, but, but you have to stand by the fact that rest of the people's safety is more important than having one person extra. I will leave some, uh, we will leave some more links in the etherpad if you want to come back later. Um, one of the books on code of conduct uh, action, if Mika, you uh, are involved in those kind of roles, uh, this book is available for free and it tells you how to enforce code of conduct in your community. So because we have two minutes, can we ask you to respond to the survey in the remaining time before we say goodbye? So it's in the last line, the link. I have to say thank you so much, Malvika and you. This has been a really um, good session <laughs> to, to be in. And I especially appreciate the last comment from you to remember to take care um, of, of ourselves as allies um, because this is really, can be really difficult work, but it's also really important work. Thank you. Yeah, so shall we set everyone free? <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, huge thanks to everyone who came today um, and you've all participated in some conversations that can be awkward and vulnerable and difficult, but are actually really important. Um, and just showing the willingness to learn these skills and to pass them on and share them with others is an amazing thing. Um, so have a great day and thank you.